Today, I'm going to talk to you about supporting grand families and kinship families in the United States. And we use those two terms, grand families and kinship families, to mean what Victor was talking about when he asked his question. So grandparents, other relatives, people that are considered family by the family, so godparents and the like, that raise children when parents cannot. So this is not babysitting or caregiving or part of a multi-generational household, which is very important to all of those things. This is where they are the, the primary caregiver and the parent does not live in the home. And it's for reasons like Victor Elevated, moving to another place for a job, it's also because the parents are perhaps in jail or have been detained by immigration or deported um, or they are, have substance use issues or severe disabilities or they've died. So there are many reasons that these families come together, but we work uh, to try to help support them. So that's our purpose. And at the United, in the United States, as you'll see on the next slide, we have seen um, a growing numbers of these families. So uh, there are 8 million children. If you'll get to the next slide, please. There are 8 million children um, in the United States who uh, live with a relative who is head of the household. So that means grandma, aunt, or uncle rent or own the home. This is Census Bureau data from the US Census Bureau. So that is more that multi-generational situation. The middle circle is what we're talking about today. So these are where the parents aren't in the home for all those reasons I listed. Um, and then the smallest circle is those numbers of children that are in the formal foster care child welfare system in the United States with relatives. So it doesn't look like a big number, but it's actually a quarter more than, sorry, more than a third of our foster care system. So that's where children are removed from their parents for abuse or neglect and placed with a relative to that child. And we have a preference in the US for doing that, for not placing those children with strangers or unrelated foster parents, but looking for kin. But unfortunately, we don't treat those kin or relatives like we do those non-relatives. There's a, a, a big disparity in equitable treatment. And that's what we've been working on one of the many issues here at the new Technical Assistance Center. So as you can see, the vast majority of children are raised outside of foster care system involvement. But you'll see on the next slide that there's been quite an increase in the number and the percentage of children in foster care with relatives. And that's because there's a federal preference in law. Every state has a state preference for placing children with relatives. Um, but what these numbers don't reflect is that many of these relatives are not quote unquote licensed foster parents. So consequently, under federal law, they're not getting the foster care maintenance payments to care for that child. So they're not, in many instances, getting any kind of financial assistance to help meet the needs of these children they didn't expect to have to raise. Next slide, please. The caregivers. So I heard a lot about grandparents, and we really have much more information on grandparents than we do aunts and uncles and siblings and godparents who raise these children when parents can't. Um, this is, again, U.S. Census Bureau data. And what we know is that a lot of the grandparents, almost half are age 16 and over, almost a quarter have some kind of disability. And many, to the professor's point, are still in the workforce. Um, which can go either way in terms of perhaps allowing them to put the child they're raising on their private health insurance or perhaps just posing another barrier and and not having enough time to care for that child so that can um, that can weigh either way for these families next slide please now why is there a federal preference and why are we seeing more children placed with relatives formally by the foster care system um, it's because uh, there's decades of research in the United States uh, and it, some internationally that shows that these children really do thrive in the care of grandparents and other relatives when compared to non-relatives. And it's, it's a lot of common sense reasons, um, you know, that these children, these caregivers know the family, know their culture, know their race, know their customs, the smells in the house and the cooking is similar. Uh, they just feel more loved. So there's a lot of the common sense um, aspect to it. But then there's a lot of things that are slightly less obvious. 
and what we know through the research is that they, these children have better behavioral health outcomes, mental health outcomes, they have more stability. They're even likely to be adopted by their grandparents or other relatives. Um, over, let's see, it's 35% of all children adopted from foster care are adopted by relatives. So they find stability in these homes too. And these aren't temporary relationships in general. These are, these are families that are caring for these children for quite a while, if not their entire childhood. Next slide, please. Now we have this new federally funded technical assistance center. So the Congress through some of the pandemic legislation, some of the COVID-19 legislation appropriated $10 million over five years to try to help the systems. So of many states um, and territories that uh, where these families live to help them serve the families better. So we don't serve the families directly because here in, DC, in Washington DC, we don't know uh, the, the community policies and laws like they do on the ground. But what we can do is elevate what's best practice out there, what's promising practice out there, and help others replicate that. Because in the United States of America, we have uh, family law differs in every single state and territory. So adoption looks different from one state to the next. Not radically different, but enough different that uh, that it's important that these families get the support at the local level. So if you'll go to the next slide, you'll learn a little bit about us uh, at the Technical Assistance Center. So we have a cooperative agreement with the US Department of Health and Human Services here at Generations United um, for um, this cooperative agreement that's over five years. So we work hand in hand with them. We've been working on behalf, I personally have been working on behalf of these families for 23 years. My grandmother raised me in part, so I have a personal commitment to these families and uh, it's been incredibly personally rewarding work. Um, the, the reason for this approach is because what we have seen for these 20 some odd years is we go into a state to help them and we find out, oh, child welfare has no idea that aging has a support program for these caregivers or aging has no idea that child welfare has a kinship navigator program. So it's really breaking down those silos among the many systems that help these families or don't even realize they're helping the families or that the families are in their caseload, but they are. So breaking down those silos, um, trying to get families uh, systems to work across um, and collaborate to better serve the families. Next slide, please. We are doing this work uh, at Generations United with five national partners. So the importance of collaboration is uh, paramount here at Generations United. We were formed as a initiative among four national groups and we still work very collaboratively and we find that that gets the maximum impact. So we have these five national partners who are Child Trends is our evaluator. They're evaluating our program for the next five years. And the other groups bring their unique expertise to our work, particularly the National Indian Child Welfare Association, which really brings that expertise around American Indians and um, Alaska Native caregivers and children. And the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging brings that perspective. Zero to three brings babies and young children. And then US aging is the, the older adults and the many grandparents who are raising grandchildren. So it's a great collaborative and working that way is really um, and very important to us. Next slide, please. So I just wanna elevate, we have been doing this work now for almost a year. We're celebrating our first anniversary at the very end of this month. And we have done quite a bit in the first year, including meet with every single state Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia across those eight systems. We've had five regional convenings where we brought those systems in to talk about their challenges and their um, strengths in serving the families. So really listening and then trying to develop our technical assistance based on what we've learned this first year. So I'm just gonna elevate a few of the things that we've learned um, and that you know, can be replicated some of it uh, internationally. Next slide, please. So legal issues, legal is a huge issue for these families, because like I said, a small percentage is in the foster care system. And when they're in the foster care system, the, that agency, the government has legal custody of those children. The parents don't anymore, the, the agency does. But outside that system, 
many times, like Victor raised, you know, mom leaves to go work somewhere else and leaves grandma in charge, but doesn't give grandma any paperwork. And here in the United States, and I suspect most places, uh, parents don't, uh, caregivers rather, relatives, grandparents don't have automatic legal rights and responsibilities over that child. Parents do. Parents are, you know, the children are born and the parents are responsible legally, but uh, these caregivers don't have any rights and responsibilities under the law. So that can be a huge challenge initially. And if, grant, if the parent hasn't signed over some type of document, like in the US, a power of attorney, um, grandma can have a big challenge just accessing health care. So going to the doctor and the doctor you could say, who are you to, to, to bring this child in? Uh, where's your legal authority? And as you all know, we're very litigious here in the United States. So uh, we, have to, we have to protect um, everyone from those kinds of things. So legal issues is a huge challenge. Uh, how to get that legal relationship. It takes time and money. It takes lawyers. It takes notice to the parents. Uh, it can be contentious. So some jurisdictions around the United States have uh, figured out ways to help the caregivers, but it's limited and it's piecemeal. But these are a couple of examples. And what we want to see is these kinds of practices elevated in other places. So Washington State funds through their legislature, through their state legislature, using their state money, a, a statewide kinship legal aid coordinator. So someone who can specifically help these families. And those are the kinds of practices that we want to see in other places and that we will be elevating through this work. Next slide. Um, another big challenge for these families is housing. So grandma may be retired to the professor's point. She may be living in a studio apartment, getting ready to go on her next cruise, really enjoying retirement. And here come two grandkids. Where is she going to put them? You know, where are they going to sleep? How is this going to work? Maybe grandma's in senior only housing, which we have here in the United States. Uh, and and it's, it may be contrary to the policies of the building to have those children even there. So there are just all kinds of challenges around housing. Um, and what we've seen in the United States uh, is these grand families housing with supportive services on site pop up around the country. And they're very exciting models. We have one here in Washington, DC called Plaza West. The photo on this slide is from the South Bronx uh, in New York City. And that's the first ground up development for these families with services on site where they just built the whole building new. And what this is, is uh, there's safety features in the building for the older caregivers. So grab bars in the showers, uh, emergency call buttons in the bathrooms, but there are also features for the children like a uh, playground. And then the, the caregivers can see the playground from their windows. So elements like that, that help um, these older caregivers and these housing programs um, in general are for the older caregivers. Uh, raise these children and have a real community of support with other families that look like them in the same building. So uh, we at Generations United did a state of grand families report. We do those every year. We have one coming up being released this fall. But uh, a couple of years ago, we did one on these kinds of housing developments. And that's a link to, to find out more about those kinds of programs that can be replicated internationally. Um, next slide, please. Another big, big, big challenge for these families is, of course, here comes the grandchild or the niece or whomever, and they didn't expect to raise these children, and they don't have the budget um, allocated to raise these children. They didn't plan to raise these children. Where does the money come from? Because children cost money. So uh, what we have very piecemeal financial support uh, in the United States, we do have a welfare program, which we call temporary assistance for needy families. It's not so temporary if it's just for the child. If it's a child only grant is what they're called here, uh, that can just be based on the child's income and to meet the needs of the child. And they're not time limited like the other welfare grants are, because there's a whole work aspect to this, which doesn't exist on the child only side. But uh, 50 states with 50 different policies and 50 different application forms and 50 different amounts. 
So we hear of amounts as low as $99 for one child, which here does not necessarily cover the, the cost of shoes, let alone all the other expenses. So we're trying to elevate best practices around those policies because there are so many variations. And that's just one example. If you go to the next slide, you will see what kind of huge variation we see around the country. And this is average. These are average. These numbers were crunched 10 years ago, so they're quite old, but they were uh, compiled by the government, the US Government Accountability Office. And so we don't have newer numbers um, as of now. But what you can see is if the kin or relative becomes licensed in the foster care system, the amounts of, of support they receive per child, which is in the middle column. And there's ways to exit foster care where there's still financial support, and that's the far right column. But the far left column is what's available perhaps to everyone else. But as I said, there's 50 different policies, um, 50 different applications. So some, some caregivers are able to get more funds than this, easier, and some caregivers um, are really they don't even know about the program. It's a best kept secret. So a real hodgepodge out there. Next slide, please. Now, one of the attempts besides the new technical assistance center to help caregivers and, and families navigate these many systems, these many inequities, these many disparities is kinship navigator programs. And these have been around, there've been a few around for 20 years, um, depending on the state again, but others um, are newer because there's been some federal funding opportunities now for about five years. So we're trying to elevate these programs and best practices, promising practices around these programs, which includes um, serving all the families regardless of child welfare involvement, because if they're in the foster care system, they already have some level of support and services, but outside of the foster care system, uh, there's generally nothing. So they really do need help connecting to services and supports. Next slide, please. So I just want to share a few resources with you that we have. You will see on next slide that we have a website called grandfamilies.org and it contains a lot of resources that are developed by our partners and others um, around the around our country, around the United States of America. Um, it's uh, not so, there's really, I don't think any international resources on there, but hopefully um, this can be helpful to, to see what goes on here, at least where I am. Um, we have uh, fact sheets for every state in the country um, and for the District of Columbia now for Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands that uh, list the, the, again, the hodgepodge of programs and services that are available. Next slide, please. We at the Technical Assistance Center um, do a number of things, uh, and these are a few of the things we do, which is, includes responding to individual requests for help, creating new materials, hosting webinars and learning collaboratives. We're also elevating exemplary, what we call exemplary practices and programs, because what we get all the time is, who's got the best kinship navigator program? Or who's got a great policy on, on temporary assistance for needy families? And this will allow us to respond to those requests. But what we found in the last 20 years is really just the importance of getting the word out about these families, their strengths, their diversity, um, and, and how we can best support them. And that has led to these opportunities, including this Technical Assistance Center. Next slide, please. So um, if you'd like to stay connected with our work, this is a QR code that will send you to our sign up. Um, our sign up form where you can sign up to receive our resources. Uh, and I'm sure you'll get these slides after the presentation so that you can um, have them. And then I just wanna turn it all over to all of you for any questions that you have for me. Thank you so much. Hello, nice a pleasure. Thank you for the presentation, it was awesome. I'm Victoria Favila, a marketer here in the Universidad Panamericana. I'm also a social entrepreneurship and a really interested in vulnerable groups. So one of my questions, it's two in one. Uh, it's, which barriers do the grand families face in school or in the educational system 
Is there currently any association that help them to integrate? Uh, that's an excellent question. And you're right, they're all, because of that fundamental issue of not having legal rights and responsibilities over the child, if you're outside the foster care system, just enrolling the child in public school can be a huge hurdle. There are federal laws um, that, that allow for those children to be enrolled. Um, and there are state policies that allow for those children to be enrolled, even if the grandma or other relative doesn't have a legal relationship. But again, it's a huge hodgepodge. It's a hodgepodge of if the states implement the federal law that exists, if they have the state policies, or maybe grandma lives in a small town where everybody knows everybody and there's no issue at all, you know, because it's a small town and we all know everybody. And so come on in, Sally. Um, then once they're through the door, by whatever means, um, it's again a, a, a hodgepodge. And what we've seen in terms of some promising practices is the it's as simple as making the language inclusive. So when you talk about, for example, my children are in college now, and colleges have moved away from calling uh, parent weekend um, to family weekend. So just language as simple as that, as, as opposed to just talking about parents, but talking about parents and other caregivers or talking about families, just making the language broader can, um, can be a huge help for these families because there are all kinds of challenges. Okay, so my name is Jose, I'm from Brazil. I'm an international relations major and also elementary school teacher. And I would like to ask you about how we can implement and stimulate the international solidarity in schools, especially when we have some kids that don't have the grandparents present in their lives. I, you'll have to forgive me because I don't know this international solidarity in schools. So I yeah, guess so that answers your question in part, is if I'm not aware of it. <laughs> So only to explain a little bit, international solidarity is different generations helping each other. So it's like the relationship between a grandparent and their kids, for example. So how can we do more of that in the schools? Yes. Well, again, it can be just as simple as a language shift and really being open to um, to all family types, because uh, you know we have a broad range of family types, right? have sensitivity for teachers uh, in the classroom. I mean, there was an anecdote that I heard about 20 years ago, hopefully this doesn't happen anymore, where they were doing Mother's Day cards and the teacher comes over to the child and says, oh, Sally, you don't have to do that because you don't have a mother. You know, so those kind of, that kind of sensitivity as well. And just, you know, the parent, the teachers and the families making each other known to each other. and. Um, Another thing we've seen is support groups in schools and making support groups available to the caregivers um, right on the school grounds, because that's we know that get, reaching these families through the schools is one of the primary ways of reaching them for services. Schools and pediatrician offices, because that's where they're going, because that's where the kids need to go. So all, all those kinds of simple things um, and then things that are much more complicated, right? <laughs> 